great pleasure to be here today and thank you very much for inviting me to come. This is my first time in Indonesia and um, I really like to be um, So today um, my talk is um, going to be about the prediction and design of the structures with the pores and channels around the perigo. Today I will um, focus on uh, rational design of ZLI frameworks, but uh, apart from that, um, I've been also working a lot on um, some other topics. And um, for example, uh, I've been looking recently at another project where we try to encapsulate nanoparticles, um, very reactive nanoparticles, inside silicates. So here, what we see is that we can make reactive nanoparticles inside the gel. And those nanoparticles in bulk usually, they would be very pyrophoric. So this is, for example, um, sodium hydride or sodium amide. But um, silica protects them. And these materials are non-pyrophoric when we put them inside the gels. Um, this uh, project actually has led me recently to um, using this technique for more biologically relevant materials, for example, enzymes and uh, vaccines. Again, here we are seeing that um, silicates uh, protect uh, those materials um, from the environment. And we can even get a thermal stability in some of those biologically relevant uh, substances. Um, you will see in my talk that I'm very interested in high pressure behavior of zeolites. So here, specifically, I look at what's happening to the framework when we compress, uh, because there are very interesting phenomena uh, when we uh, compress zeolites. And I will talk a little bit about that work too. I'm very interested also in synthesis, um, in understanding specifically um, areas where um, we do very small tweaks to synthesis. And these uh, tweaks can bring um, big changes in structure and um, properties. So today I will talk about um, mainly this um, area and this area. So um, most of us in the audience know what zeolites are, but I, I thought I'll just add this slide here. Mm -hmm. So we all know that zeolites are corner-link tetrahedral alumina silicate structures. Mm -hmm. The primary units of the in zeolites are the tetrahedral units, where we have one silicon or aluminum connected to four oxygens. And these tetrahedra connect to each other through very flexible oxygens, make um, frameworks. Um, sorry, um, I forgot to mention. So um, today we know uh, about 50 naturally occurring zeolites. We can synthesize in the laboratory 204 uh, different zeolite structures. And there are millions uh, of computer simulated hypothetical structures. So there's a big um, step of, of going between being able to predict uh, which structures uh, can exist and being able to synthesize them in the laboratory. So let me talk a little bit about um, the goal of trying to predict which structures we will be able to synthesize. Let's say um, I want to do some kind of reaction like this where I'm trying to modify a molecule. So if I want to be green, uh, I want to use, of course, um, a catalyst. And um, let's say I want to choose a, a zeolite catalyst. So I will be specifically looking for um, a specific pore size where this molecule can enter. And then I will look at the catalytic sites, obviously, to do the reaction for me. Now, it would be really nice to um, be able to, to do this um, in real life, because we can, um, for example, have some kind of application, specific application, and, and choose a zeolite uh, to do the reaction for us. But this is impossible. This is a dream. So um, th th there are problems on, on the way of um, trying to do this. And there are 
many different problems. But I will highlight here two, uh, two problems. The first one is um, the bottleneck problem of going from millions of hypothetical structures to actually predicting which one we will be able to synthesize. The second one is even if we can't predict which structures we will be able to synthesize, um, it's not very easy to just go in the laboratory and synthesize the structure because um, we need to choose a, a template, we need to choose conditions, um, so synthesis again is quite tricky. So let us uh, have a look at the first problem here. <coughs> um, to, to try and solve the first problem, we decided to use the following approach. We decided to look at all of the existing structures, so all the ones which uh, we can already synthesize, 204, and we wanted to see what properties they all share. And if we can find a common property, we then can apply this property to the hypothetical ones, and uh, obviously that might help us to choose amongst hypothetical structures. We found very, very um, interesting property, the uh, intrinsic flexibility of the structures. And uh, I will explain um, why we've chosen it. Um, so in, in order to study the intrinsic flexibility, we wanted to do some simulations. And um, conventionally, we would use um, today molecular dynamics or ab initio um, simulations. But these kind of simulations are really good for studying uh, reactions or uh, calculating energies. But they're really not good for uh, looking at the geometries of the frameworks. Uh, the problem a lot of the times is because um, it's really costly with the conventional methods to um, calculate the geometries, um, the geometries get, get ignored and the flexibility get ignored. And uh, this is the issue we wanted to address. So we decided to um, uh, come up with a new way of simulating um, frameworks, which we call geometric simulation. So in this method, what we do is, uh, is really very opposite to the conventional methods. What we take into account, we take uh, into account most local strongest forces. So we take the tetrahedral uh, bonding and angles and the steric interactions into account. And we ignore all the long-range interactions. <coughs> so it's a, it's a very simple way of simulating uh, the geometry. It's implemented in um, the code GASP, Geometric Analysis of Structural polyhedra, and it's a very new way of uh, simulating frameworks. So um, if, if, if anybody is interested uh, in more detail on the geometric simulation, um, we can talk about it later. I won't go into detail now. Let me show you some uh, results which we uh, got from the simulations. So here we are looking at the uh, results for the Fougercite uh, ZLF framework. So, <coughs> Fougercite uh, has um, bonds for silicon oxygen at 1.6 angstroms, and uh, at the ambient density, it has density of uh, about 13.3 um, tetrahedra per thousand angstrom squared. It's a very peculiar measure which the allied people use. Um, tetrahedral angles, oxygen, silicon oxygen angles, are around 100 and 9.4 degrees, and what we find is that if we take this, the ambient structure and if we optimize it using geometric simulation, we can make all of the tetrahedral units close to perfect. We can make all of the bonds 1.61 angstroms with very small tolerance and all the angles equal to 109.4 degrees. So, so that tells us that we can make the structure, all of the tetrahedral units in the structure, close to um, completely non-distorted. Um, we then uh, increase the density uh, of the structure. So we are basically compressing the structure. So if we compress the structure, what we are seeing is that all the bonds are staying the same. So there are no distortions for quite a wide range of densities and all the angles are not changing too. 
there comes a point where we've uh, compressed it so much where uh, the bonds start changing and the angles start changing. So this tells us that the tetrahedral units start deforming at this point. On the other side, if we decrease the density, so if we try to stretch the structure, we see that the edge of the densities where the deformations start to occur happens quite fast. So as you can see, there, there is quite a wide range of densities where the tetrahedral units are not deforming at all. So that was quite interesting uh, when we saw it for the first time. And we thought, okay, something, something must be changing. If, if you compress the structure, something must be changing. If we look at um, bridging angles, so these are the silicon oxygen silicon angles between tetrahedra we can see that these angles are changing a lot. So if we go from ambient structure to a very compressed structure here, we can see changes. So this aperture uh, in the channel changes by more than one angstrom um, between this point and this point. As you can see, the angles are changing a lot. So one of the angles is almost close to 180 degrees. But um, there comes a point at the edge of this um, range where the angles just lock. And this is where we see the formations start to occur. So we call this um, range of densities a uh, flexibility window. It was interesting to see that the ambient structure lives at the low, low edge uh, of the window because we were expecting it in the middle, originally. <clears throat> now, um, when I started first looking at um, uh, at the flexibility window, I, I looked at first at all um, cubic structures. So there are 14 uh, cubic tetrahedral zeolites. And we can see that all of them have flexibility window with um, varying sizes. Um, I then thought, OK, some of these structures exist as um, alumina silicates, some exist as silicates, and some exist as uh, germinates or um, germanum silicates, for example. So then I decided to look just at silica zeolites. And again, we can see that all of these structures have flexibility window. And even uh, denser structures, crystallite, glass, and quartz, have flexibility window. So that tells us that there is some, some commonality between all of them. That's one thing. Another thing, it tells us that uh, the flexibility window does not depend on the chemistries. And it's an intrinsic geometrical property of the allied frameworks. Um, since then, we actually looked at all 204 um, zeolites. And we found that all of them have flexibility window. It, it varies between different structures, the size of the window but they all have flexibility window. And interestingly, they all, uh, at ambient conditions, live at the low density edge of the window. So this tells us that in nature, they are all maximally expanded. <coughs> so this is just a small video showing how um, the, the, the structure changes within the flexibility window. So we're just looking at the changing the densities from one edge to another. And you can see there are a lot of variations here. And um, this is just one of the modes um, how the structure can change. Now, it was interesting to find that uh, all zeolites are maximally expanded. In uh, 69, Bernal said in all coherent structures, there is tendency to arrive to minimal volume. Um, we know that, for example, if, if we look at metals, we have close packing in metals. If we look at proteins, um, proteins um, uh, bind uh, in a very, uh, again, uh, close structure. So uh, in many materials, indeed, there is tendency to arrive to minimal volumes. But it's not true for zeolites. Now, <clears throat> why, why they are maximally expanded? At first, we thought maybe it's due to the channel content. We know that zeolites have cations. They can have um, uh, organic molecules in the channels. When we make zeolites, we use structure directing agents uh, to uh, synthesize zeolites. So there's quite a lot of um, water or organic molecules inside. 
So is that what's uh, keeping zeolites maximally expanded? Uh, now, th th that might be true for some zeolites, but not for all of them, because uh, we can remove structure direct directing agents out of the pores of zeolites without destroying the structure. We can exchange cations, again, without destroying structure. So that, this tells us that it's probably not, not the uh, channel content which keeps them uh, expanded. We then decided to have a look um, at the repulsion between oxygens. We know that um, zeolite uh, channels are lined with negatively charged oxygens. And these oxygens repel each other, of course. And uh, when we compress the structures, what we see is that first collision, collisions happen uh, between those codimeric tetrahedra, codimeric oxygens. So this tells us that um, those codimeric oxygens are repelling each other, and they are probably keeping the structure more open. Um, we also know that in a, in a lot of zeolites, when we put all the water in, inside the channel, the unit cell of zeolites shrinks very slightly. So this tells us that the polar water screens this um, repulsion between the oxygens. And that's probably what's keeping the zeolite structures maximally expanded. And now, I mentioned in the beginning that um, in the laboratory today, we can synthesize 204 zeolitic structures. But there are millions of hypothetical structures. Um, my collaborator, Mike Tracy at Arizona State University, has uh, one of the biggest databases of computer simulated structures. <clears throat> he now has more than 6 million structures in his database. And we, we know that he has, we know that he has uh, gems in the structure because um, every so often when a new structure is synthesized, he, he finds um, uh, some of them in his database. But um, he doesn't have any, um, any criterion for choosing the ones which we will be able to synthesize. Um, actually, he refers to his collection very lovingly as my stump collection. So this is an example of one of those hypothetical structures. It went through um, a lot of different tests and it came out as a good structure. Um, when I uh, looked at it using geometric simulation, I find that it has a lot of distortions. For example, you can see here that the tetrahedra are overlapping. So this structure doesn't have flexibility window. And that, um, so I hypothesize that we will not be able to synthesize the structure, at least as, a, as, a, as an aluminous silicate zeolite. Because we found that all of the uh, existing structures have a uh, flexibility window, and a lot of hypotheticals, and now we found about 99% from this database don't have flexibility window. It led us to uh, hypothesize that the existence of the flexi flexibility window is an important uh, and necessary factor for the structure to be synthesizable. So this can help us to choose uh, amongst those millions of those hypothetical structures. Okay, so as you, as you can see that um, the most direct way of um, obtaining the flexibility window in uh, uh, zeolite structures is by looking at the high pressure behavior of zeolites. So I'll show you some examples where we looked at the uh, high pressure behavior and we find very interesting phenomena which are connected to uh, the flexibility window. So, so far we've looked at four um, frameworks, um, Analsim framework, MFI framework with silicolite 1 zeolite, phaugicide and sodalite. And as you can see, we can, we can look at both single crystals and the powder and zeolites. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And the puppy zeolites, and uh, we can obtain good results from, from both. <coughs> so, <coughs> Analsim um, framework um, is one of the densest frameworks amongst uh, zeolite uh, structures. Um, Analsim crystallizes in different, uh, naturally crystallizes in different um, variants. Um, so, we can have um, 
sodium alumina silicates, we can have potassium forms, calcium forms. And here we looked at um, these four um, single crystals. As you can see, um, there, are, there are lots of different variations here. But the framework, um, essentially, is um, very similar between them. Um, now, analcim itself has a, a very interesting phase transition uh, when uh, it's put under pressure. It undergoes um, a very interesting phase transition from the highest symmetry, from the cubic symmetry, to the lowest triclinic symmetry with a very large volume change. And uh, um, up until very recently, nobody knew why, um, why it basically goes from the highest symmetry to the lowest symmetry in one go. Because in, in many zeolites, we see um, several phase transitions where if we start with the highest symmetry, we can go through some intermediates where the structure would go in, in orthorhombic, for example, or trigonal forms, and then uh, lower the symmetry down to triclinic form. Now, what, what we find uh, when, we, when we look at the flexibility of an um is something very interesting. So, I'll, I'll explain the data here. So, the experimental data which we have on an alcim lies between points A and D. The flexibility window, theoretical flexibility window, extends between points C and B here. If we take an ambient form of an alcim, it can go into orthorhombic form very easily. It can go to trigonal form very easily too. But when it's compressed um, at the edge of the flexibility window, it has very little scope to go into any other form. And because it's, it's already quite a dense uh, zeolite to start with, it, it just doesn't, doesn't have any ability to go into any other structure. And that's why we're seeing such a dramatic um, phase transition into the lowest symmetry, which would be out of this page, and we will not be able to see it on this graph. So um, it's interesting to see that all the forms of um, analcim zeolites, um, analcim pellucite, virocyte, and leucite, they all undergo very similar phase transition. And it's interesting to see that the, the cubic um, flexibility window extends up until the phase transition. So what it tells us is that um, the flexibility window for the parent compound before the phase transition basically controls where the structure um, is going to go. And uh, there is just no scope at the phase transition to support any other intermediate form. And that's why it goes into the lowest um, symmetry. Now, um, here is a second example. So here we are looking at the MFI framework, um, zeolite silicolite 1. Um, we found that um, it undergoes very interesting, um, it has very interesting pressure behavior under different circumstances. Um, it amorphizes at around 3 gigapascals if um, there is nothing present inside the channels. But it remains crystalline if we have something um, in, inside the channels of the framework. So we can see here that um, if we use silicon oil as a pressure transmission medium, so the, the silicon oil would not enter the channel structure in this framework, we can see that it, we lose the crystallinity at around 3 gigapascals. But uh, if we put um, carbon dioxide or argon, it, it remains crystalline up until 17 gigapascals, or maybe even uh, for, for longer than that. <coughs> so that was, that was interesting to see. When we um, tried to do simulations on the structure, what we find is that um, it remains within the flexibility window up until the um, pressure-induced amorphization. And since there is nothing in the channels, the structure practically collapses, and that's, that's what leads to the amorphization. But if we put something inside the channel, so here we, we have either carbon dioxide or <coughs> argon, we can go 
to very high um, pressures, um, to, to, to 20 gigapascals, without losing the salinity within the structure. It compresses, it compresses uh, quite um, extraordinarily, but uh, it does not collapse because we have something inside uh, the channels. So um, I guess the, uh, the relevant um, example here would be uh, a wine rug. You know how the wine rug would collapse if, if you don't have any bottles stuck inside? But um, if you put the bottles inside the wine rug, you can't collapse it because there's something which is bracing the, the channel structure. <coughs> Skip this. Um, so let me just summarize. I've told you today about um, this new property, flexibility window, which uh, is a range of densities on which the structure does not deform its primary units. We found that uh, all of the existing zeolites share this property. And a lot of the hypothetical structures do not um, have this property. <coughs> I've also told you that uh, zeolites in nature are maximally expanded, so we can com um, compress them quite easily, but obviously we can't stretch them very easily. Uh, the existence of the flexibility window can be uh, one of the criteria for selecting amongst millions of the hypothetical structures. And I've showed to you that um, the flexibility window is connected to the phase transitions and um, other phenomena in uh, zeolites. Um, I have um, a lot of really great collaborators working with me. Um, Dr. Wells um, has written um, program GASP for geometric simulation. Uh, Mike Tracy at Arizona State University has the database which I use. And I've been doing high pressure work with um, Matt, um, Diego, and um, uh, Dr. Haynes. Um, I have several students working with me at Oxford and uh, at Bath. Uh, looking at uh, the high pressure work and zeolites at, and at synthesis, and uh, I get funding from the Royal Society, STFC, and EPSRC. And thank you for your attention. So how far is it possible we could be we directly in a real and the by uh, we compress the structure and so they have uh, the distortion of the structure. It's possible in a real in a real experiment. My, my second question is uh, you said you, you say you also say that uh, when there are uh, organic molecules in uh, in deputy or channels in your in the body say there's no contributions in uh, in flexibility of window, how come like that? I think uh, as a template, as a template, okay, they have must, must have contributions to control the the, the window. Um, yes. So um, several points here. So let me just address the second point first. So I said that but it's true that in a lot of structures, um, when there is uh, a template or a tire present structure, we can remove it without destroying the structure. That tells us that um, it's not the primary um, the the cation or the uh, organic molecule do not play a primary role in, in, in having the structure maximally expanded. But we found that in some zeolites, you know how when when you remove organic molecule, the structure collapses. So in those structures, it's important to have the organic molecules without them. The structure will not, the framework will not be supported. So um, it, it's true. It's it, it's true. It's important in some zeolites, but not in all of them, because in, in most of them, we will move on without destroying the structure. So the the um, we, we think that um, uh, the repulsion between the oxygens across the channel 
is more important because uh, that really was keeping the the course open. So there's still an uh, organic molecule in, in, in the channels and uh, we we compressing, okay? So uh, there's no uh, effect again uh, to the uh, organic molecule to to uh, uh, say to uh, determine uh, the 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 being established. I mean, we can solide and then so, there's uh, organic so, molecule. Yeah, in the in the example with um, silicon light, for example. When we have some things inside the channel, so when we have carbon dioxide or argon in the channel, the structure is really not, not heavy when we compress it, but it's not collapsing. So there's no uh, pressure induced amortization. So you see, when there is something present, so when we have carbon dioxide present, the structure uh, under compression is not, it's not really heavy, but, but it is staying crystalline, it's not collapsing. So it's very important that. And when, when we have empty channels, the structure collapses quite easily. So, so, so it does play a big effect. Yes, yeah, okay, well, thank you. I think you. Sorry, would you. The lady there with the phone. Thank you. Yes. Is there any relationship between the function and surface of the cell to? The, the reason in fact that yes, if you have if you change the chemistries in the light, if you for example have um, silicate structure and uh, germinate structure, there will be a difference between absorption of the two, of course. So, um, but in terms of geometry and flexibility, fundamentally the two frameworks will be very similar. The size of the uh, flexibility window might, might vary, then, but uh, they both have a flexibility window and they both be very flexible. But, um, of course, the chemistry will determine, will determine the differences in the absorption or in the other I think I think there's a number of questions, but I think in view of the time, uh, we could talk later. And I'm, yeah, is that an apology? But I think we've got everyone. Thank you once again. For